Um, okay, so we're kind of going through, um, we've, we're getting towards the end of our class on evangelism. This has kind of been our last uh, little uh, section that we've been working through. Uh, previously, we've talked about how we need to have a care for the lost, like Jesus did. We talked about the, the things that usually uh, trip us up as Christians from sharing our faith. We talked about um, you know, having a conscience, having uh, care for the lost. Um, being aware that, they, that they're there and taking the opportunities that we have, having the courage to take opportunities we have, and then working on our craft um, as well. And we have talked about how we can work as a collective, how it's not just one person or each of us individually trying to go and teach the lost. We can work collectively. We can work together. And that's, in fact, how God um, is formed the church to be that kind of way. And then... We've kind of been talking about some, some of the processes for how you uh, kind of, someone becomes a Christian. Um, and we looked at John 4, which is like a master class in that subject, um, and, and just the general process of becoming a, a Christian. Um, in, in general, the things, the, the mental things that you have to believe in to get there, uh, believe that there is a God that the Bible is his inspired word, uh, that I am a sinner, I'm not perfect, I'm not even good, um, that Jesus is the Savior I need, and then uh, that I want to devote my life to him. Those are the kind of mental steps someone has to go through to be a full disciple. And then last time we talked about um, kind of doubt and faith. And, and to, if you were, we didn't really talk about individual doubts or individual things that you need to work on. But the, here's the three main categories of doubters. You have the intellectual doubter, the disappointed or wounded doubter, or the rebellious doubter. So the individual doubt, uh, intellectual doubter is the one in which it's some kind of mental thing. It's some kind of um, logical, uh, some kind of uh, maybe argument they've heard. Uh, something that is 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 kind of in in their in their way um, there, uh, in which they, for them to develop the faith to overcome that doubt, they need to have a conviction of mind. Uh, they need to be presented evidence. They need to be in touch with the word. Um, which uh, going through Mark or Luke will kind of do all these things of of faith. Um, and then you have the disappointed or wounded doubter. This is the person who through either life events or Christian people who claim to be Christians that didn't act in a Christian way towards them um, and it wounded them and turned them off to the gospel. And so they need to have a trust of heart. They need to learn to trust God again. Um, and it, again, go through Mark or Luke and it can help you through that. Um, and then also a rebellious doubter, the one that just wants to do what they want to do. They don't want to go through the sacrifices that it would require to become a faithful disciple, or they want to do these other things instead of being a disciple. Um, and what they need is surrender of will. Um, and again, if you let God and his spirit work on you uh, and his heart, you have an open heart and open to the truth. Um, all these things will eventually change. And it's just us being patient, working with the person, understanding where their doubt is, and helping them um, get what they need. Um, it does not help if they're, um, this is what their doubt is. That's what really is the driving force. They've been hurt, and we're just like trying to beat into them this intellectual stuff. You know, you know well, this verse says you need to be baptized, and this verse needs to say you need to be baptized, and this verse... And that's not the problem. In fact, you're probably going to turn them off. So um, that is what we've kind of talked about so far. Any, any questions on that or anything to um, pick up or anything like that? Okay, cool. Um, so today we're talking about uh, two different things. One is religious investment, and the other one is, is um, home or group Bible studies and how... Um, those play a critical role in evangelism. First, we're going to talk about a religious investment. And what I would like to ask is, what is religious investment? Or what, 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 would you, what do you comes to mind when you say religious investment? Tracy? I'm just completely guessing. To me, it sounds like the time and effort one person puts into a wrong, obviously, but the time and effort one person puts into a wrong, obviously, talking to a non Christian person. Okay. Right. 
or we could talk to a Christian who has a uh, weak little faith, or even just talking to a Christian who has uh, years of experience. I feel like it's a personal thing. I'm investing this amount of time with these people to gain, to help, to learn. Yes. So there, there is an investment of time and energy into the person that you are talking to and the, that you're teaching. That is certainly the case. Um, that's not exactly what I'm meaning by this term. Um, I don't expect you to necessarily read my mind uh, when I put this phrase here. What I kind of mean by this, it's the investment one has into the particular religion that they adhere to, uh, whatever that said religion is. It is the investment that they, they have. Uh, think about it so this way. Why are most people religiously where they are today? Okay, they feel comfortable there. It's where they were 10 years ago. It's where they were 10 years ago, yeah. They may have been born into it. Yeah, certainly. Did, do you think most people, um, like, you know, let's take like a Methodist, do you think that an, the average Methodist has went around and been like, okay, what do the you know, Calvinists believe and what do the Lutherans believe and what do the uh, Baptists believe and, okay, and what do the Methodists believe? Okay, let's look at those. Okay, I think this one is the, the truth uh, and those other ones are you know, wrong. Do you think that's what majority of people do? No. No. I would even say probably a majority of Church of Christ Christians probably don't even necessarily do that. Um, so why did they end up in the place that they were? Um, and it's a lot of, because of a lot of things that you stated, they were born there, they've been there for a long time, uh, that's where their friends are, that is where their associates are, that's where they got comfortable in. All of that is religious investment. Um, if your social, your friends and your family are part of that thing, you're invested in. If you're teaching and you're part of the, you know, a teaching program there or a part of the leadership of that place or you have specific jobs, you have investment there. Um, all of that is, is what you've dedicated your time, your energy, your image, your uh, identity that you have invested with the particular uh, religion that you have um, adhered to in your own life. So that's what I'm kind of meaning by it. Does that make sense? Any, any questions on how I'm defining that? And there's a lot of denominations, too, that have a lot of <clears throat> intersocial uh, activities and so forth. And uh, I know several. And, um, you know, always saying, well, Tuesday night I got this, and Thursday night I got right. this, and Wednesday night, you know, this is what. And they, they do a lot. And among the church. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of people will uh, become attached, particularly to a denomination, uh, if there's other activities. Yes. Yeah. They're, it's part of their daily routine or their weekly routine. It's part of their schedule. They have a lot of investment into the particular uh, place that they are. And as I think, is, I don't say that as a bad thing. I just think that's what it is. We have a religious investment too. Like uh, we have uh, the investment, the, the social, the friends, the um, everything that that would, that that comes from that. Now, I, I I will say just what I said uh, earlier. Now, I do believe that the people who um, were born into the particular set of beliefs that they have, or um, that have been there for quite a while, or whatnot. They, they, if you ask them, they do believe that what they're following. I would say majority of them do believe that what they're following and the people that they're associated with, or the denomination they're associated with, they do believe that it's true and that is from God or something like that. I, I would highly say that, um, but it, it's kind of the the usually the social. And the social relationships are where you're born in comes first, and then the doctrine comes later on. Um, and it kind of only, um, if you're not careful and you're not pursuing the truth and a love for the truth, it can just confirm what you're already in. Uh, it's very easy for that, that to happen. Okay. Any, any questions or anything?
Okay. Um, so the reason that, um, uh, so why is it helpful for to know someone's religious investment? So talking as, you know, us trying to evangelize to spread the gospel to the lost. Why is it helpful to know somebody's religious investment? Excuse me. It gives you a selling point. Gives you a selling point. Okay. Well, uh, let's say so. Not necessarily, I would say that. By what I mean by like, so what, why is it helpful for you to know the person, the prospect, the person you're talking to, your friends, religious investment into whatever religion, doctrine, whatever that they believe in? Why, why is that helpful? Yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that's a big part of what we talked the process, the process of uh, disciple. You want to start where they are and not talk to them about baptism before they even believe in God. You know, that, that yes, yes, good. Why, why else? Um, so I, go ahead. Yeah, it, it really shows uh, some of the values, which, which really helps. Yeah, yeah, very, very true. Uh, another reason is, is I would say that typically the people that Christians target, uh, the people that I've known, uh, Christians who want to become evangelistic, they target people who are usually a part of another denomination that have very similar de- de- beliefs um, that, you know, what we believe the Bible teaches. Um, and they are very, they're already very involved in their churches. They're very um, good people in general. You know, what we would think the perfect target is. And usually those are people who have very high religious investment in the denomination or the church that they're already at. And so you will not, it would be very hard, and you're fighting an uphill battle to get them to leave the church in which they have friends, in which they're a big part of, and all that. Um, statistically, the people that have a weak or no commitment to any other religion or church are overwhelmingly the people that are most likely to convert to a new group. Uh, that is across all groups. That is across everything. Like Statistically, by far, the people who have a weak or no commitment to any other religion or church are by far the ones that are more likely to convert to a new new group. Um, that is to say, I don't. I'm not saying that you should not teach the gospel to everyone you come in contact with, whether they are very involved in the church or not. I think you absolutely should, um, and I believe that the gospel is power enough to break through anyone to anyone. But you're fighting uphill battle if they're already very steeped into a particular religion. Um, and what I've kind of found is that you can easily be part of, you can get in this conversation, you could develop a friendship, you can um, have, spend um, a long time with someone that is, has a great religious investment into their particular church, and you can have great conversation, great Bible studies for months and years, and they won't change. Um, you may even make some progress in their in their um, particular uh, beliefs. Maybe you can correct some of those, but they will not leave the church that they are a part of, or the whatever synagogue, mosque, or that they are a part of, because they're very uh, involved in in their church. Again, I don't say that to not teach them. I'm just saying we need to have our eyes wide open when we do that. Um, and we need, also need to know when to just say, I'm always available, but I need to go teach someone else. Um, that too. And always making those, those, those things. Um, if, you look at, um, um, if you look at Paul, he did this. Who did Paul have the most success with? 
Was it the diehard Jews? No, usually not. Usually it was the God-fearing Gentiles. That's who, by and far, he had the most success with. Um, if you look at um, his, his time in Corinth in Acts 18, it, it talks about um, that Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus, and they opposed him and reviled him. And he shook out his garments and said, Your blood be on your own hands. I'm innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man, came Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, and his house was next door to the synagogue. Uh, those, when those people who were diehard Jews, and this happens over and over and again, runs them out of the synagogue uh, because they have high religious investment into what they believe in, uh, which makes them blinded to the actual truth, he turns himself to the people that um, you can have a little bit greater success with, and he, and he does. Right. So, so it took Peter's job, really. <laughs> in, in, yeah, in, in some ways. Again, he taught everyone as, as we should. But he, I, what I don't want to happen, and the reason that I think we need to uh, kind of have our eyes wide open this, is I don't want you to um, go through the process of making a, a good friend, and this is someone that um, you want to uh, teach them the gospel, and they are a person that has high religious investment into a particular church, and you work on them for years, and that is the only person you ever work on. That is what I want to avoid. I'm not saying that you shouldn't talk to them. I'm saying that you should know that they're going to require a lot of time and effort, and you should always be open to spreading the gospel to other people, um, just, like, just like Paul did. And if they reject you, you go somewhere else. If they are, it's very obvious that they don't want to believe you. They don't want to. They don't want the truth. You do the same thing that Paul did numbers times. Do the same thing that Jesus did numbers times. You wipe off your the dust off your shoes and you go to someone else. Don't cast pearls before swine. Um, that is what you have to have uh, in mind. Any kind of uh, thoughts? Yeah. And you are always open to it if they change their mind. Um, and I'm going to talk about one or two things I think that we can do to help if it's a, that particular person. Uh, but you're always willing for them to change their mind. And you're loving and you're an example of Jesus and you show it in your actions. And um, who knows what kind of change that they can have on their heart. Um, this is also why I don't get uh, discouraged when you kind of see the constant reports of the decline of Christianity in America. Because it's a lot harder to change someone who is very invested into a false doctrine than it is to take someone who has no doctrine whatsoever and teach them the truth. Very, a lot easier. And so the, the decline of Christianity in America means that evangelism just got that much easier, basically. Um, so, like, look at that as a good thing. Because it is so much easier to, to, to um, teach someone that has a clean slate who feels the effects of being in the world very clearly uh, than it is to kind of uh, teach someone that's been inoculated uh, with just enough of, the, of truth to be um, not susceptible to the real truth. Um, so I, I think that's part of it. Now, on the flip side, should we want in religious investment? Yes, yes, we should be invested into what we believe. We should be invested into the truth. We should be invested into um, God and Christianity and the church and everything. Should we want the people that we teach to have religious investment? Yes. When they are new, how much religious investment do they have? Like, very little, if any. Like, yeah. And, and, and if you think about it, okay... And you think about religious investment as this: How what would change in your life if suddenly you came onto truth or whatever, and you believe that what you currently believe believe in the church that you go to was wrong? 
how much of your life would change. And that's how much religiously invested you are. Um, if it's someone that's kind of here every few weeks, you've been, you know, not really committed, maybe not much has changed. For some of you, you've been here for, you know, decades, all your friends are here. Like, it would be a massive change in your life. Uh, you usually teach classes, you would no longer do that. And, and so that shows how religious invested you are. So uh, we want to, you should be religiously invested. You should be invested into the church. You should be invested into um, uh, Christ and everything. So, and how can we build, how can we help with the new Christians, uh, maybe someone that you've been baptized, that you help teach the gospel, or someone that someone else here uh, taught? How can we as Christians um, build religious investment in new Christians? That's bad grammar. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, how do we build religious investment into new Christians? When you say new Christians, those are the ones who have been baptized. Yes, they, they've been baptized, and um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. So one lady like, talks about is teaching to help them develop their knowledge and their understanding of the gospel of Jesus, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of stuff you don't know when you're first baptized. Um, and then also the constant encouragement and growing relationships. Yes. Both of those are critical to developing that. Yeah. Like I, I feel like I have a great relationship with that guy now. And so that was, we spent like two hours together probably, maybe three. Yeah. And like that was incredible. So I think that that's, an, that's a really powerful way to get to know someone and build that relationship with them. Yeah, exactly. It totally. Building that relationship and letting um, them see in your life that this is not just some stuff that you kind of follow. It's, it's your life. It is, and it shows it. Through your story, through your actions, everything. Emily? Um, your mom has some great opportunities. Like you have Bible studies where you have to go and get to know them more. You have groups, get together where you, they can, you know, other people can help build those relationships. Yeah, yeah. So hospitality is a big part of this, uh, both for you personally having someone over versus also having groups of people so you can all kind of mingle. We're going to talk about group Bible studies, why that's. That, that fills that, that, that function a lot of the time. Uh, but yeah, excellent. You've you got to build those bonds. You have to build those, those, um, uh, those ties to each other. What else? Um, let's see. I think we had this. Build relationships with them. I, I think we, talk, we, we kind of talked about that. Um, very often after Paul was baptized someone, what very often did he do right after that? He would go home with them. Yeah. 
Yeah, with Lydia, with the Philippian jailer, like he would, he would have, he would um, teach someone and baptize them, and then he would go home with them. Like, and he would, and it's part of building those relationships. And you could tell from the letters, he has very deep connections with the people that he he taught. Um, he built those those bonds deep. Um, good. Um, another one is have a healthy environment. You don't want to teach someone, um, and you've been having a great one-on-one story, uh, studies, and finally they become a Christian, and then they show up to the church, and it is not great at all, and they're discouraged right from the onset. Um, it is not good. A local church that is having a healthy, loving, and unified um, is going to have a lot more success than a church that is divided, contentious, and full of negativity. Um, and I think that should be apparent. Um, you're, you're just going to have a lot more success if you bring a newborn baby into an uncontaminated space where they can grow and they can flourish and they have people looking out for them um, than a place that is the opposite of that. I think we're not, it's not rocket science. You know, it's, I think that's pretty self, self-obvious. Um, help them find the role. The number one reason, statistically, according to all the six that I've looked at, the number one reason somebody will stay at the place that they are is if they have a role in the place, in the church that they are, that they're, they're a part of. If they have a, a job in which they can fulfill that matches their, their strengths, um, they feel like they're a part of it, uh, which I, I think this is something that, in my experience, in uh, the churches of Christ that I know of, have failed in a lot. There's very few roles, and they're filled by longtime members. Um, and, and there's plenty of work. Believe me, there's plenty of work. And we've done a really poor job of delegating that to, to people, especially new Christians, where their own unique strengths and their own unique traits could be help fill that role and be part of us as a body. This goes back to when we study Ephesians 4, when it says that uh, it, Paul describes the church as a body in which every person has their role, and when everyone is fulfilling their role, uh, the body builds itself up in, in love, and it's just a self-perpetuating uh, per- uh, thing. Um, we need to help them find their role um, in, in, in the, 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 the church. Um, and then also help them to develop their relationship with God. Um, now, that we can't directly do, correct? Like, that has to be part of their own individual. They have to put in the time and effort to build their relationship with God. However, there's definitely some ways that we can either encourage it or discourage it. What are some ways that we could either encourage it or discourage it? Prayer. Prayer. Yeah, pray for them. Yeah. Yes, excellent. Um, or example, example, be an example in prayer for them. Mm-hmm. Yes, excellent. Um, one of the number one questions of new Christians is like how to pray, uh, because many of them have not done it or done it in a particular kind of way before, um, and so that is a very like you can help them in that thing. Yes, very, very much. What else? Very much so, and, and just in that case, being a mentor in, in some kind of way to that new Christian. It worked out very well for her. Yes, yeah, it, 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 yes, exactly, very good. What else? And I, I would say also, yes, talking about it I think is very good and, and kind of describing how that relationship with, but we should be living lives in which that's evident through the way we, we, we 
um, engage. Like I, I've said this before, when, when people come in here, new people, especially new Christians, you know, come in here, they're watching you guys. They are. And part of that is just trying to learn, okay, what are the things that we're doing here? What are the, you know, what, what is it? okay, we stand up when we do scripture. Okay, I didn't know that. Like, they're watching, they're watching just so that they could learn. Uh, but they also see if you're passionate, if you really believe the things that you believe, or you're just going through the motions. You can tell. Are you singing and full of joy and praise and love and admiration for what God's done for you? Or are you just like, Jesus loves me. Like, like, there's, like, you can tell the difference. Or if you're nodding off while the sermon's going on every single week and you like not engaged whatsoever. Like, you begin to think: Do these people really believe what they say? Like, what I was taught and the things that I uh, that I believed were true and from God. Like, that should have a profound change in somebody's life. And yet, these people are like nothing is happening. Like, they're supposed to be these Christians that have been Christians for years and years and years, and there's no zeal, there's no growth in them, uh, that if they see that, why would they continue? It's, it can be very, very discouraging. Uh, and so we need to be encouraging people that uh, through our actions and through our own striving and our own passion and our own uh, growth uh, to, to be better each and every day. Any, anything else? Okay. Good. Um, really quick in this section to, and to get into the next one. Um, I want to tell you a story about Barbara. Uh, Barbara was uh, someone I knew through a preacher, one of my preacher friends. Um, my friend, um, um, Barbara was from a Lutheran background. She was a very religiously invested Lutheran. Uh, she had high religious investment, so it wasn't usually the type of person that would usually be converted. Um, and she even despised the Church of Christ, too, because she had some prior uh, bad um, uh, interactions with some, some people from the Church of Christ. Um, and she was very connected to her Lutheran church. But um, one of the uh, older couples of the congregation got close to her and invited her to a group study that was going on. And through that uh, process, some of her walls started to come down. And, and they further came down when her car broke down. Uh, her car broke down, but she was still wanting to go to church. Uh, and so she called this older couple, and they brought her to the, the church, the local church that, that was there. Um, and the, her car actually was broken down for a couple months. So she came to the, the, the church there for a couple of months. Like, the people were very encouraging, supportive, some of the, especially the, the widows. She was a widow. So especially some of the widows really took it upon themselves to encourage her, to get to know her, to build relationships with her. And so more of the walls came down. And, and it even really tilted a lot when, during the course of those two months, not a single person from her Lutheran church ever called her to ask how she was doing. But she was getting constant encouragement, constant calls from the people from the church that she was attending with this older couple. And, and it wasn't long after that, after she studied a little bit longer, a few months later, uh, she decided to give her, her life um, to Christ and to be baptized. Um, and that only happened because people did the kinds of things that we've been talking about. Building relationships, beginning good character, working on them slowly but surely. Uh, truth has to be preached, and truth should be preached. But love also must be shown, and love is what brings down the walls so truth can have its impact on people's hearts. And that's what we need to, to keep in mind. Um, and that's what we need to live. Um, and that's how you can break through to someone who has very high religious investment, but, uh, but you can uh, break down those walls steadily over time through the things you do, the things you say, and the example you live in your life. Any other thoughts or questions on religious investment at all? Okay. Um, really quick, I wanted to go through... Um, 
the purpose of group Bible studies. These were two th subjects that I thought were important, but they both couldn't necessarily fill the whole class. Uh, so I'll put them together. But um, the group or neighborhood Bible studies have a very uh, uh, particular role, uh, important role into the work of evangelism, just the, the health of a church. Uh, this is from Acts 5.42, shortly after the... Um, the, um, the church was formed. Uh, it says, Every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching the, that, that Christ is Jesus. So you see them teaching in the temple. It was probably their big gatherings together um, that they, that they um, came together and they, of course, preached that Jesus was um, Christ, but also from house to house. These smaller uh, group Bible studies that were important for how they, um, they taught uh, people. And, and this is what the neighborhood Bible studies are. Um, what do small group Bible studies look like? Um, they will usually be 5 to 15 people. Um, so you want to keep it pretty um, small. Um, 15 is really large. Um, actually, you'd probably want 5, five to 10, ideally 5, maybe 12. Uh, but you want to have an intimate enough group where you can really get to know everyone. Um, they will be weekly for 8 to 12 weeks. Um, you want to have that as a kind of sections, so you can build up anticipation for them. You know, we're going to have our Bible study. Uh, you know, be able to invite the friends that you've made connections with and that kind of stuff. And it's for a set period of time. It's for 8 to 12 weeks. Um, that way, you know, you can kind of have cutoff periods. Um, it's really good to have some around um, the there's spring and really good around fall. Um, summers and the holidays are not necessarily a great time because, um, well, summer schedules, people's schedules go crazy. And, and um, the holidays, again, people are traveling in and out. But spring and fall are typically the best time. Or in, in some cases, you can have just a once a month kind of, kind of study as well. Um, usually, it will be a ho at somebody's house, a local person's house, um, or a quiet public place, uh, Panera. If the Panera is pretty quiet, um, you can do it there. Or a quiet coffee shop that has enough room, that kind of stuff. Usually, it, it can be a good place. Uh, I, I've done a thing called Meetup, which is basically you show that we're meeting up in, uh, at this public place to study the Bible, and you'll get people that just see it on Meetup and, and just randomly show up and want to study the Bible. And it's a great place where you can get um, uh, contacts. Um, there will usually be a prayer and share time, um, a time where you can uh, share what's going on in your life and pray for each other. Um, and then it will usually cover foundational materials. This is... Not um, you're not getting into the you know Romans or something heavily theological. Um, there are some exceptions to this. Um, probably one of the most um, attended studies will be a study on Revelation uh, because people are very interested in that. And so uh, you can do it, or the Holy Spirit is another one. Uh, so you can venture out there, but typically you'll do foundational material. Luke and Mark are kind of the go-to um, combined with Acts um, can be really good um, things. Um, and then there's a time to connect afterwards. Um, what would you say is the, why would you, what are the benefits to having a small uh, group Bible study? What would you see, what are the benefits of that, particularly for evangelism? Yeah, so it's more intimate, which means, what, what are the benefits? What? Everyone gets involved? Yeah. Yep, you, you, the group doesn't feel too big to, ask, uh, to have comments or ask questions about it. Very good. What else? You get to know your name. Like, it, you, you, it's harder to hide, you know, in, the, in a group that small versus, you know, a bunch of people. Uh, usually we had... We have around 70 people here, and so you can hide more 
or uh, it can be very intimidating to see all these many people. It's much easier to keep track of, you know, five names or ten names. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that's good for even those of us who are, are Christians that, you know, this is something that we could continue. And everyone can participate. In fact, the people that are the, the best um, uh, fellow people to have in this group are new Christians. Because you'll ask the questions that these non-Christians are thinking uh, because you're, you're very close to where they are. And you can really help, and, and they will think, okay, I'm not alone. Okay, I'm not just, you know, some, some dumb person that doesn't get this. We're all actually trying to learn together. It's also very low threat. It doesn't feel as, um, as high, you know, of a, of a threat as maybe coming to a large um, a, a place or large worship. Uh, you can connect to several people, and it can be a very uh, great kind of mid block um, thing to do before you come to a service. I've had several people that would not want to come to a worship service, but would go to a small group. Um, and then if you go to a small group, you get to meet a few people, what happens when they come here? They know people. They, they already feel like they know people, and so not everyone is a stranger. Um, and so there's several benefits to having group a Bible study. But um, oh, all those... Um, but there also takes a lot of stuff to make it work. Um, there are a lot of things that make it work. What are, what are the stuff that would be required to make a group Bible study work? Commitment, Commitment of, of, of uh, yeah, for us to, to, to be there. Good. Well. Okay. Right. Good. Yeah, that's definitely the case. What What is required of us to make home Bible studies, group Bible studies? Work? Yeah. Somebody's, somebody's got to be willing to host it. Um, like, if nobody will willing to host it, you can't really have it. Good. What else? What? A plan to Virginia. A plan to Virginia. So, well, somebody leading it, um, I, I think, is, is a big part of it. What else? What if um, no one invites anyone? You kind of have to have some people that are willing to invite. Um, you can't, it won't do much evangelistically if you have a group Bible study in your home and you never invite anyone. Um, you, you have to be willing to invite. You have to have people that are willing to teach. You have to have people willing to co-learn. We talked about that in a previous lesson. People willing to babysit. So if people bring their... Uh, their kids, and uh, it's very hard to learn when their kids are going all over the place. Um, but if you have someone that can take them to outside or in the next room where they can, you know, uh, take care of the kids and they can they can learn, uh, willing to pray during the Bible studies, willing to pray for the, for these people, um, and willing to connect. If right after the study's done, everyone just leaves, and the person that is the the non-Christian is like, can't even get out the door before everyone else. That's not good. Um, it definitely um, hurts Hurts that. Um, you have to be willing to connect. You have to be willing to um, use that time to build relationship. And, and the research supports this. Tom Rainer, who I've used a lot of stuff, he's a researcher on who on what causes church to grow. And he says that a church that does not have small group studies will not survive. And because of that, his, his conclusion is because you will not evangelize. And there's another study that was done, one of the biggest studies that was ever done, with over 10,000 different churches. It was a German study. They found that the number one common factor 
that differentiate growing churches from non-growing churches is if that church has small groups. Um, it is just a critical role that, that, that those play. Every church that is good at evangelism has small groups. Um, and it works for their, to evangelize, and it also works to connect us individually. Um, you have to have small groups. Um, that's just what studies have shown. That's what every uh, really evangelistic church that I've ever known, they've had small groups as a part of it. But it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of people stepping up to make those happen. Um, and if they don't, if those people don't step up, those things don't happen. So um, we need to uh, seriously think about um, those kinds of things.